Now, yes. Not, not so much. Hello? Hey. One, two, three. Well, just. Okay, so welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here uh, in this incredible week that we are facing. Um, Storefront Salon Series invites scholars and architects to discuss some of the ideas contained sometimes within the books that have uh, taken years to write or sometimes issues that are just in the air. There are many issues that have to do with data, that have to do with cities, infrastructure, and politics that we might not be able to address tonight as we are uh, trying to enter into the work that Nicolas has been working over the last few years. Um, you are all inside the Ratfing Room, a uh, space that was built with the purpose of producing comedy as a new form of engaging with uh, the way in which deal with art and politics. We didn't know this would become a room for tragedy, and this is what has happened since the day in which we opened, in November 8th. So the question here is how do all of us now take the responsibility that for a few years we had given to the elected politicians to represent us on the ethical and the social and the political grounds that we more or less believe that we're taking care of. Now it seems as if we are in a time in which each one of us has the responsibility and also the opportunity to really take in each one of our own actions that what we somehow were hoping to produce as a collective. We as a storefront for art and architecture are extremely open to suggestions and ideas about what you think that from a place like this one could be happening as a way to discuss, debate, and understand the actions and the discussions that should be happening in the intersection of art, architecture, and design. And so, with that said, it's just an open invitation to send us any of your suggestions at info at storefrontnews.org. On Friday, we are going to be here. We are already closed, as you well know. Storefront is closing, according to this exhibition. Um, the real estate pressures are making us disappear into the ether of nothingness, as many of the cultural institutions are, uh, in fact, uh, uh, suffering or engaging. It's a joke, we are not closing. But, um, but with that said, we are going to keep open. We believe that discussion and debate is probably the, the best way in which we can serve the community that we are here to, to serve. So with all that said, um, I'm going to read the CVs of two individuals who I have known for a long while. I remember the first time I wrote to Jeff, I was teaching at Rice University at the time, and I said, hey, all my students are more aware of you than Pevsner. And so I need to really figure out how do we actually start having a conversation of the architectural history that is being written into a sphere, uh, a digital sphere that now has very much changed from that very beginning when Jeff was really one of the pioneers in bringing the architectural discourse into a space of convergence. So Jeff Monod is uh, author of A Burglar's Guide to the City about the relationship between crime and architectural design as well as the long-running website Building Block. Mano is also the editor of Landscape Futures, Instruments, Devices, and Architectural in Inventions. Previously, he was senior editor of Dwell and a contributing editor at Wired UK, as well as director of Studio X in New York City, an urban think tank and event space at Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. Of course, these four lines, they don't make uh, a, a tribute to whatever he has been doing over these last few years, but it's a way to introduce him into this room. Guys, the ones to push everyone, and we will definitely welcome you into these front rows. Um, um, Nicolas de Monchon, who I've never managed to pronounce his surname properly, but I will. So, um, he's Associate Professor of Architecture and Urban Design at UC Berkeley, where he's the director of the Berkeley Center for New Media, and he's a fellow of the American Academy in Rome. He's a partner in the Oakland-based architecture practice Mode M, Mold de Monchot. Um, de Monchot's first book, Space Suite Fashioning Apollo by MIT Press, was named a best book of the year on numerous design and technology list, and I'm assuming that everyone in this room has a copy. I remember going into the lounge at the Studio X in New York City, actually, of that book. Um, and his design work has been exhibited internationally at venues including SF MoMA, the MCA Chicago, the Venice Architecture Biennale, the Lisbon Architecture Triennial, and also here at the Storefront for Art and Architecture. 
With that note, one of his drawings actually is right now on view in a pop-up uh, space that we have at FX Foul, where we are showing a series of drawings that had been produced as part of the drawing trilogy of a Storefront for Art and Architecture drawing show. So if any one of you is curious about what fast buildings might be, you uh, are all invited to join the Open Gallery at FX Foul, or if not, next 24th or 25th? 25th Wednesday next week at 7 p.m. for an event about drawing and the power of the line in the definition of those edifices of thoughts that as architects we can devise and produce and that might not take as long as the architecture as we know it might be. So with that said, I will just again invite anyone who wants to be in the back and feels that should be in the front to come and walk by. There are at least two more little seats. Um, and with that, I would just like to ask you to give a very warm welcome to our guest for tonight. And I want to thank you for bringing this book into this incredible week in New York. Thanks. Uh, well, thanks, Eva, for the introduction and also for hosting the event. And um, thanks to everybody for coming out in these final two nights of the Republic. Uh, Friday will be quite interesting, so stay safe. Um, I've known Nicholas for a long time, and um, I think we must have met maybe the first time seven, six or seven years ago. And uh, uh, I, I'm obviously very pleased to be doing this, this launch for his new book. Um, I was going to give a brief introduction. Uh, Eva just covered some of that, so I thought I would just sort of um, take off with uh, really what kind of drew me to your work and then um, give a brief introduction to that, ask you some questions, and then throw it open to the audience. So uh, I'll get through maybe five, six, seven questions, depending on the, how the conversation is going and how long answers are, et cetera, and then we'll throw it open. So if you've got something burning to ask, uh, just raise your hand, and I believe there'll be at least one microphone going around. Um, but so if you know Nicholas's work before Local Code, you're most likely to know it through his book Spacesuit. Uh, which came out uh, in 2011 uh, through MIT. And um, that was really, I think, one of the, the first times that Nicholas and I really started uh, having longer conversations, and I interviewed him for um, uh, Building Blog, the, the website that I, that I run. Um, but what is really so extraordinary about Spacesuit and um, Local Code, the new book, is, is really kind of a direct follow-up of Spacesuit, and that's one of the first things that we'll be discussing is exactly how it relates to this earlier uh, investigation. Um, but what I think was so exciting and original about, about the Spacesuit Project was that it did at least two things, and it did both of them very well. Um, one of them was a very unexpected history. The book is a, is a design history of the Apollo spacesuit. So it's the um, article of technical clothing that was worn by U.S. astronauts in order to leave the planet Earth and enter into another worldly environment. And so there were a lot of questions that had to be answered by this garment. So it had to not only perform in, a, in another uh, uh, altogether uh, different uh, uh, planetary circumstances, but it also had to be come in on budget. It had to uh, answer certain material questions, et cetera. Um, but so what I think is really funny about this is that the actual production of the spacesuit, and uh, pardon uh, any redundancy if you've already read the book, um, but is that it uh, really kind of reveals this unknown or at least underpublicized uh, backstory to it, which is that, in fact, uh, the spacesuit was made by the Playtex Corporation, the same people who make uh, bras for women and, and women's undergarments. And it was made by uh, female seamstresses that did uh, hands-on uh, tactical experimentation with, with uh, different sewing patterns and different ways of combining fabrics in new ways. Um, what I think is so interesting about that is that it not only kind of reveals this uh, alternative almost feminist history of the of the, the spacesuit, but it also has this kind of magical implication that in the uh, traditional vision of almost like these alpha male US astronauts standing on another world like John Wayne, they were in fact wearing women's undergarments. And I think there's a nice magical irony to that that is often uh, overlooked in, in the discussion of how we got to the moon. Um, but then the second part of the book, and this is what leads to, to local code, is that it presents how data, how um, the notion that we can use uh, overwhelming computing power to solve urban problems uh, is something that has been really hardwired into even architectural practice today. You know, a lot of what we refer to as parametric design uh, is a direct descendant of this, this way of, of, of thinking about data and its relationship to urban space and architectural production. Um, and so that leads to many, many questions. But um, one of the things I think would be interesting is to draw out how this notion that the same techniques that took us to the moon, as, as, as Nicholas is, is, has quoted in, I believe, both this book and, and in Space Suit, are the same techniques that will clean up our cities and give us the, the, the bright new metropolis of the future. 
Um, so I'd like to use that saying that this is a you know material from spacesuit, but as a question to say, um, could you really kind of introduce all of us to where this book, Local Code, comes into the picture here and how it draws on this, um, the data history that you uncover in, in spacesuit and how you got to this today? Um, uh, well, thank you everyone for coming. I'm really touched and impressed and well, let's see how that works. I might just have to pass it back and forth. We are the world style. Um, <laughs> uh, thanks so much, everyone, for coming out in a, in a difficult week um, uh, and uh, and spending your time with us. I'm really, really grateful to you for for uh, for doing so. I think that um, the the what I hope to get to in some of the later discussions is how uh, information and power and the city are uh, are changing uh, in our time and how information gives us the power, uh, gives us the, p the potential to have power even in uh, difficult and, and complex circumstances that might otherwise seem out of, uh, out of our control. But to, to answer specifically the, the question, it's a, really, um, it's a really interesting question. And the way I would answer it is to say that the, to, to explain both the origins of the spacesuit book and local code at a more fundamental level, um, in I, uh, I'm an, I'm an architect, I, I, I practice, I mostly fabricate uh, work at, at, at full scale for gallery installations and exhibit designs. And when I'm in my shop um, and I, I can't do something, um, I often, uh, 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 more often than not, find myself having to make a tool that doesn't necessarily exist. Sometimes it's just because I can't afford the right tool or you know, sometimes it's because uh, uh, the tool for doing a particular bizarre thing you know, that I'm trying to do doesn't necessarily exist. So the epoxy and, and, uh, and duct tape comes out and something gets made to, to do the job. Um, I would say uh, in, in both cases, the, the, so the most profound resemblance actually between the spacesuit book and the local code work is the need to make a tool that doesn't exist. Uh, in the case of the spacesuit book, it was because coming of age, um, going through architecture school in the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, I, w I was right on the, the board, right on the ver in the very last uh, introductory class of, of, of students in my in, in my grad school who were expected and taught to draw by hand. It was kind of a stigil at that point, you know, but it still was happening. And then by the time I graduated, we had all of our studio space had been destroyed uh, in the favor of kind of office cubicles. Everyone was working digitally, and it was a completely different practice. And this profound conceptual shift in how we make architecture was completely unexamined by the ostensibly like critical and theoretical program um, uh, at Princeton that I was in as a graduate student. And so most fundamentally, I said, well, where is the, the, the I, I, I have always had this feeling, which my later work has, has, um, has proved to be a, 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 a miraculously correct intuition that the technology is at its most fundamental core, like architecture, a cultural artifact that it has certain technical requirements around it, but it is an embodiment of its time and it embodies a set of principles and biases um, um, uh, just like a building does. And so, but as I looked um, I, uh, at the landscape of what was being written about architecture, especially at that time, there were critical histories of issues like uh, uh, gender and, and, and politics and prisons and all the, all the kind of usual suspects of architectural discourse. And then there was a bunch of people getting really excited about technology, but there was no critical social cultural examination of technology itself as an instrument in design practice that I could find at the time. And so Spacesuit had its origin uh, as, as a project in trying to produce such a history, but like any good history, wrapping it around a singular artifact and narrative and going, being able to, to escape itself. It was a tool that didn't exist that I had to spend time to bloody well build for myself because I, I, I couldn't find it anywhere else. And the tool, so the deep dive I took into the history of the technologies from aerospace fundamentally that have ended up so profoundly shaping architectural practice in the last several decades was an attempt to understand, well, where did these tools come from? I hear a lot about the military industrial complex. What was it? Where did it actually, what day did it come into being? Like all of these questions that seem very simple, but this, this single, um, the, the thread of the spacesuit allowed me not to get too far lost as I tried to explore all these other questions about technology I wanted to investigate. And I knew the fundamental story about how in designing for the body in the context of this most heroic and male 
uh, uh, narrative of the Apollo program, the the actual suit was fabricated by Playtex. I found this out relatively quickly. I was able to do a couple of interviews straight away with the, some people who had you know who had been alive at the time who'd participated in this process, and it was an amazing story as well. So it carried that narrative forward. I expected when I was writing that narrative that it would be a great parable, a kind of metaphorical uh, uh, apparatus to say, well, if these aerospace techniques of optimization and systems engineering failed at the scale of the human body, we might expect to be suspicious about them at a scale that architects have always equated with the complexity of the body, which is the scale of the city. But what I discovered very, very late in the process of writing Spacesuit is that what I had expected to be a kind of system of metaphor was actually a material history in and of itself. And that, for one example, we were just talking about this, um, the, the very first, uh, when the Department of Housing and Urban Development was founded in, in 1968 with George Romney Mitzdad as the, as the first secretary, the director of research and development for HUD was the former uh, director of nuclear propulsion research from NASA. And the computers that had been used during the Apollo program to compute mission trajectories that were no longer by 1968 necessary were literally trundled down Constitution Avenue to the Marcel Breuer building and used. And so what I had expected, again, to be to be kind of a, an illusion was, in fact, a material history. And all of these, there had been all these very unsuccessful projects to... Um, uh, uh, to literally export the technologies, not the spacesuit technologies, but the larger scale systems engineering technologies from um, uh, aerospace practice into the city, including here in New York, where uh, during the John Lindsay administration, there was an, actually a, an office of, of the RAND Corporation, the Aerospace Spin-Off Research and Development Corporation, in the mayor's office, responsible for uh, uh, putting, uh, creating, quote unquote, more slippery water in the fire, in the fire system, and, and, and famously, um, uh, as, as written about by Joe Flood, the, the optimizing the locations of, of, um, uh, of, of fire stations throughout the city in a way that directly resulted in the Bronx fires. So the, the, you know, the, this history was really, really interesting. But as a, fundamentally as a practitioner, not a historian, uh, I was most interested in the way in which this history provoked my thinking about the tools that we were using. And, and 2009, 2010, when I was finishing the spacesuit project was kind of the apex of parametric culture and architecture, which having gone off into the world of history and theory for a couple of years was a deep and disorienting surprise to me when I came back. And I was like, are you, are you, are you absolutely kidding me? You know, I, um, I, I remember going to, there was a, a conference in the, um, uh, in 2009 in, uh, uh, at USC, I had just moved to California, to, to Berkeley, and I went down for the conference. And it was a conference on parametric urbanism with the usual suspects there. And um, what was interesting to me, what I knew from my own research, is that the um, uh, I was asked to do a review of this conference for a publication that remained nameless because they spiked the review. Um, and I, I, in the end, I was so astonished, all I did was juxtapose quotes from the 2009 Parametric Urbanism Conference and from a conference held in the same auditorium at USC in 1967 called The Cybernetic Approach to Urban Analysis, you know, that was part of the same, uh, the, this kind of heroic aerospace approach to the city. And even in trying to assemble and juxtapose the two quotes for this review, I lost track. I had to go back and look up which quote was which because they were so interchangeable in their in their borrowing of this language of optimization of all we need to do is feed all the data into the computer and the, the city can be refined and honed and, and stripped away. We can get get rid of a lot of waste and all of this kind of language uh, around urban life, which is a as some you know anyone who appreciates the complexity and beautiful redundancy of cities is, 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 is appropriately alarmed by. So that's a long way of getting around to the fact that I said, well, what I really want to do, though, I can't just say that this mode of practice is ridiculous. I need to actually show as a practitioner what a better mode of practice might be, because I know also the enormous power that digital technology and computation have, even as it embeds certain assumptions. And so local code was a, was a, was a slow effort of, of searching around for different modes of practice that might make better use of data, based in part on some interesting failed programs of that 
um, uh, of that moment in, in HUD's history of automated site design and the approach to large databases of, of urban data that didn't exist at the time, but which we, of course, have now. The, the very last thing I'll say is all, all local code really is is a piece of software the which, I, the which I wrote with, with um, the help of many students and colleagues at Berkeley, which connects geographic information systems or electronic mapping to parametric design tools in order to design multiple things. In this case of local code, it's 3,659 designs for ecological infrastructure in vacant spaces in four cities. Um, it, it, it's to, and, and those, to that, those tools make such a design process possible. And we can go into a little bit later why vacant lots are so interesting and why they're very probably um, uh, deeply important for thinking about um, urban resilience. But that's probably a long enough answer to your question. So I'll stop there for now. No, that, that's great. Yeah. Um, well, well, my next question actually was going to be, and, and follows on from that quite yeah. closely, actually, yeah. which is uh, looking at this. One of the things I think is so interesting about local code is that even though the sort of the macro story is about the yeah. use of data and the use of all of these technologies for urban modeling and really precise interventions on vacant lots and strips of land with a very, very localized, almost sculpted approach using data, um, what's interesting is that in the prehistory of that, um, Nicholas locates the artist of Gordon Mata Clark, who I think was probably familiar to most of the people in the room. Um, but if not, I guess my question is, could you both introduce us briefly to yeah. Mata Clark and why it is that he fits in, in the book, but then also um, give us a little bit of the intellectual context, because after all, we're even sitting in a neighborhood where that was really right. quite ha handy at the, Absolutely. At the time. Um, so you know, G Gordon Mata Clark is an interesting figure in the history of architecture, who is both outside of the practice of architecture, but also very much in it. Um, not least um, uh, because his father, the Chilean painter Robert Mata, was the was the draftsperson for most of Corbusier's Ville Radios. He had left Chile to go work work with. Corbusier in Paris, and then um, decided that Corbusier's designs were were appropriate only for a imaginary creature who lived in perfect harmony with the work and uh, work and the state. You know, not incidentally, and uh, fell in with the surrealist instead. Had uh, twin sons in New York, um, left the mother of the of the twin sons, um, and um, and and went back to Paris. And and Gordon Mata Clark grew, grew up in the West Village with. Um, uh, his mother, Anne Alpert, and went to, um, wanted to be an artist, but went to architecture school at Cornell during the heyday of the Texas Rangers of, of Colin Rowe's arrival. Um, uh, uh, really uh, despised that, that context, but, but in some ways learned a great deal from it, and then came to New York and um, became famous for, um, uh, well, first of all, um, engaged as the, as the only one of a circle of young artists um, uh, around figures like Robert Smithson and, and Donald Judd was one of the only people who actually knew how to put a building together because of, I mean, he was not a very good architecture student, but he had had to attend classes in, in construction and, and uh, HVAC and all the rest. And so he was one of the primary um, kind of literally sort of contractors for the conversion of, of uh, Soho lofts in, uh, in the 1960s and opened the first... Um, uh, artist, it, it wasn't, it's often called the first restaurant in Soho, but there were actually lots of like bodega type restaurants there already for the workers in the light industrial factories, but it was the kind of first sort of high concept restaurant called Food in Soho, um, uh, and then became famous for these building cuts, which you, you probably all know. Um, and then um, uh, right before he, uh, um, one of the other things he did in the kind of craziness of New York City real estate in the 1970s was purchase these 11 small vacant parcels that became, were never intended by him to form an artwork on their own, but which his widow um, uh, uh, ended up exhibiting as a uh, framing and matting and exhibiting as an artwork called Fake Estates starting in 1992. And he was very interested in vacancy and vacant lots. And right before he died, it turns out, as I, as I discovered through the research for the book, he had both become deeply interested in computers. He had corresponded with people like Bill Mitchell, back when Bill Mitchell was like the only architecture computing guy in the 1970s at UCLA. And, um, uh, and then he'd also become very interested in doing real community-based work in this neighborhood in the Lower East Side um, and was successfully funded as a um, by the Guggenheim Foundation to start to run a combination youth education and vacant lot upgrading core um, uh, here on the Lower East Side. That was funded in 1976, um, uh, uh, and he uh, tragically died of pancreatic cancer in 1977, was not able to follow through on the project. Um, but that the but but towards the end of his life, he was uh, he was very much no longer in, interested in returning more to architectural practice, but to a very different. 
socially engaged practice that was um, you know, driven by both data in the case of uh, the, the New York City real estate roles that he paged through by hand, and then also um, uh, by the community action and, and uh, infrastructure that came out of engaging and upgrading vacant space. Um, in fact, I, there's one photo of the, of the early effort of, um, I'll bring it up, of, of this vacant lot not far from here. It's kind of a great photo. Yeah, there it is, breaking through the asphalt and starting to do work. Do you know exactly where that is? Or? Um, I, I do not. I have not been able to figure it out. It was, uh, it was a photograph that was found in his files and was included in uh, the, one of the first retrospectives of his work in uh, the MCJ in Chicago. Um, but uh, one could probably, with, with more detective work than I, have, I, I was able to do, figure it out. Um, well, so one of the things that I think is so interesting about local code is that, in a sense, you're taking the spirit of Mata Clark, yeah. you're finding the interstitial, overlooked, marginal yeah. spaces of cities, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Venice, New York, um, and then finding a new way to commute, or excuse me, to compute and yeah. model a response to that. So I'm curious if you could actually just kind of give the ground up version yeah. of, of what, is, what, the, what the book is about and how it is that you're uh, building on this legacy so that people understand what exactly you did with local code. Absolutely. So if... Um, direct your attention to the um, uh, TV for a second. So these are the, um, uh, this is New York City. These are the lots that Meta Clark found, the vacant lots that he sold that are part of this um, artwork and, uh, uh, or part of this exhibited artwork now that David Zwerner um, uh, owns and um, or has sold many, many parts of. But if you look today for, um, if you use a, a geographic information system to look for vacant lots in New York, you find many, many thousands of sites. You don't need to find them one at a time. And they turn, um, uh, and this is the case also in, um, uh, in most American cities that, that new, these digital tools allow us to, to kind of sift through and query uh, massive databases of, uh, of, of both private and public land to find these kinds of vacancies that, that were like catnip to Matta Clark, but, but which he didn't necessarily have the tools to, to find or discover um, uh, at this scale. The work that I did, uh, I've done um, um, both um, starting with students at Berkeley and then in my own studio, um, focused initially on these sites in San Francisco, which are called um, unaccepted streets. They're zoned as rights of way, zoned as streets by the city, but not maintained as streets. So they're dead ends next to highways uh, in poor neighborhoods. And the um, uh, and if you juxtapose, uh, if you look at these these this are kind of archipelago of vacant land um, uh, in the city next to other kinds of data, a very interesting story starts to emerge. So first of all, they overlap with some of the most um, uh, park poor, underserved um, uh, areas of the city with the highest public health risks for things like asthma, highest rates of reported crime, um, uh, and a whole variety, um, um, very high scores on a whole set of social need indices. And then if you overlay um, uh, environmental data, like this is the urban heat island, um, the red, red is bad. These are impedances in San Francisco's stormwater system. The dots are bad. They overlap um, uh, almost one to one. They're, they're, they're you know, in this very curious way, like pre-optimized for uh, for an enormous amount of environmental work, and then also not incidentally the provision of um, of meaningful um, public space to those parts of the city that that. Um, that, that have them the least. Um, m most of all, I would say this is in the local code um, and, and, and this book is an argument about how we think and spend around infrastructure. And this is a particularly important point um, you know, in the next few weeks, our new president is likely to unveil a massive uh, infrastructure plan that focuses, um, uh, uh, like his ego and like his arguments on on bigness, on on and and uh, being being the notion that the biggest is the best. Whereas it turns out. Um, you know, really big pieces of infrastructure are a really terrible idea because a, a thousand foot levee is useless against a thousand and one foot flood. And it is the tendency of technology, again, you know, things we know about technology but don't acknowledge, you know, that it mostly breaks, right? And it, it will break all the time in ways that we don't necessarily expect it to. And so a network of uh, thousands of micro interventions can, can fail at a huge level. 20 or 30 percent of the interventions can completely fail. And the network as a whole, this is how bodies actually work and how resilience actually is built in systems, the network as a whole will actually preserve. And not incidentally, if you, uh, because we know 
through these digital methods how much work all these sites can do. We could take a big pile of infrastructural funds like was recently spent in San Francisco and target a precise amount to many thousands of sites according to its ecological benefit. And that would buy us not only massively more ecological resilience, but it would buy us um, um, uh, parks and investments in, in, in some of the, the, the city's most underserved and deserving uh, uh, neighborhoods. So that's fundamentally what the project is all about. And since uh, we, we started to do that work, we've built, um, we've, we've done uh, kind of corollary studies in partnership with nonprofits and, and urban ecologists in uh, San Francisco, LA, here in New York. We did a, a small project on the vacant islands of the Venice Lagoon, dealing with different environmental issues, but along the same principles as part of the 2012 um, Biennale. Um, since you mentioned infrastructure, one of the things I wanted to get to later, but seems appropriate now, um, is exactly uh, that question of scale. So yeah. as we move forward into the sort of the Trumpian um, right. economics of, of what turns out to just be uh, effectively a, a trillion dollars worth of tax right. breaks for yeah. people to engage in building projects, yeah. um, I guess I'm curious about how it is that you see this kind of thing implemented and where uh, responsibility, where... Uh, funding and how right. this sort of infrastructure would come into being, aside from just being a kind of architectural and parametric right. fantasy. Well, the the you know that that was my f my first. Uh, so this project, I should give um, full full credit, was first funded and developed as part of a, a really interesting competition organized by UCLA's City Lab in two thousand nine um, uh, called WPA two point at the at the end of the. Uh, uh, it turned out to be the end of the most recent crash and at the beginning of the Obama administration as a way to, to frame uh, proposals by architects about infrastructure to the federal government. And uh, the, the work was first presented in, um, in, in DC as part of a larger conversation. The, 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 interestingly enough, talking about traditional ideas about infrastructure, the, the winning proposal ended up being a huge floating levy for New York, like something that's big and legible and, and was potentially saleable. I think the, um, but since that time, I, I especially with that as the project beginning, I, I have really, um, you know, had a lot of really interesting conversations at many levels um, with policymakers and mayors in, in, in cities like Minneapolis and Detroit and San Francisco about these kinds of ideas. And it's usually something like the office of the mayor that is the biggest supporter of this kind of idea. Someone, one, one of the only people in the city whose responsibility is to think about all the city and how all the parts come together, how things like infrastructural spending and social, social need can potentially come together. Unfortunately, at any register in urban governance below something like the mayor's office, uh, an idea like this is very threatening because, of course, there's all kinds of people who are making all kinds of money out of the existing state of affairs as far as the amount of enormous mon money we spend on infrastructure. And there are, there are lots of programs around urban greening in cities like New York and Philadelphia and um, uh, Chicago and San Francisco, but they almost entirely, with some notable exceptions, and Chicago's is one of them, um, they tend to be almost entirely focused on the kind of feel-good component of the um, uh, of the exercise on you know a park for poor people and when you get right down to it and what most of these programs offer is the fact that if you want to make a park for your neighborhood on public land they will agree not to arrest you for doing so which is what you would otherwise do so there's no actual funding whereas you know the argument presented by this work is in fact this should be you know the po huge pots of money we're spending digging up streets and putting in bigger pipes for example, for stormwater remediation in um, a city like San Francisco could be much better spent on the surface, not only because the, the, the infrastructure would be more resilient from, from an infrastructural perspective and more effective, but also because it would actually put that money not under six feet of soil, but in a neighborhood where it can do all kinds of other work when it's not dealing with the three or four storms a year where, where stormwater is really an issue. So... You know that, but that's a very that's a very important argument. That's an argument that I will continue to to make and push forward. The book, in a way, is both a, a tool in that argument. It's it's one thing to to you know give a PowerPoint. It goes away. It's another thing to be able to leave someone with a very tangible, bright yellow object that <laughs> that is a kind of uh, 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 argument, um, uh, theoretical and uh, um, uh, and social argument for it. And uh, 
but it's also a difficult one. But I have, you know, especially here in New York, where um, uh, I've worked with uh, very closely in, in preparing the proposal here with uh, Timon McPherson's uh, Urban Ecology Lab at the New School, a great group of people on on uh, on the actual science of what specific vacant lots. Uh, Timon and his team have mapped over 30,000 vacant parcels in New York, um, uh, about a, a, uh, many of them public, some of them private, and done very specific ecological analysis of, of the individual sites. And then there are also great nonprofits here in New, in New York, like Green City Force, that does job training with urban greening. And so, um, uh, you know, the, to, for, for this to really become a policy argument, it needs to be much larger than my work, much larger than any one person's work. But there are groups of people and people who are really interested in this, this kind of work who are doing the really difficult work of implementation, uh, uh, scientific analysis, and the, the, my best aspiration for the work is that it will contribute to, in a, in a meaningful way, to that kind of larger scale collaboration. Um, it seems really interesting to me that in, in, on, on another level too, there's the question of visibility. Yeah. Um, I, I've even uh, recall being at, uh, present at architecture and kind of real estate development conferences yeah. where people have reacted with, with visible, almost disgust at the notion that we would invest in small pieces of infrastructural intervention right. as, as opposed to some Herculean, right. you know, uh, Rooseveltian sort of uh, super yeah. project that would actually yeah. you know, bring like our generation's Hoover Dam or right. our generation's Golden Gate Bridge or that kind of thing. Right. But what's interesting about that then too is that who is it that you're appealing to politically that might support the project? Because if you have right. the irony here then is that yeah. you've got people um, and this is a, gr a gross generalization that yeah. I'll say for the sense of uh, conversational provocation, but right. you would have people that might be perhaps left of center that would want the kind of visible super project to remind themselves right. of a kind of Rooseveltian grandeur, right. uh, which is ironically sort yeah, of yeah. the Trumpian yeah. approach. But then you've got the kind of, it's your responsibility, it's a smaller intervention, the community can take care of it. Right. Traditionally speaking, that's a slightly yeah. more, um, you know, let us do the work for ourselves. Right. That's a slightly more right of center political approach. So my point is that you would have a kind of, yeah, political uh, uh, proposition here that is a bit orphaned politically because not nobody on either right. side really wants to take it. I mean, look at yeah. Scott Walker in Wisconsin yeah. to not to go on for too long, but yeah. um, I mean, his vision of infrastructure in that city is to build more and more super highways, kind of strangling right. Milwaukee and, yeah. and and other cities. Whereas actually, there's these other projects yeah. coming up which are. Um, talking about intervening on the level of foreclosed houses in cities like Milwaukee, for example, where yeah. um, you would actually just you could flood the basements of abandoned homes as a way to mitigate against uh, storms and even climate change and that kind of thing. But so, what I think is interesting about this is just yeah. simply that, in, it, it, and we're going to see more and more of this over the next four yeah. years, is that infrastructure and its imaginative appeal, I think, is going to have huge yeah. conflicts in terms of yeah. who wants to own what, who wants to pay for what, right. who wants to take personal responsibility to actually yeah. go out and take care of some of right. these smaller garden plots that you've identified mm -hmm. in the book, et cetera. Well, there's a, there's a good piece, I think, even, um, uh, in this week's New Yorker by James Sirwecki on the economics of infrastructure, you know, in anticipation of this and how we don't, we don't even pay for maintenance versus like big projects um, uh, because they're so much more politically legible um, than the, and even something like the WPA 2.0 you know, in the end, having lots of really interesting ideas inf about infrastructure, but the thing that they felt comfortable presenting to Congress was you know the big floating dam. You know versus the a million um, uh, a million small pieces. Um, I would say in my practical experience, it, you know it it has been the people who are really supportive of of, of this work are um, political figures like Gavin Newsom in uh, in California, who's without of whom it wouldn't have happened to begin with. I mean the the uh, who are you know left of center but deeply pragmatic about the, the there's a kind of um, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, you know, and and you know, Newsom is also very uh, uh, excited and interested about the way in which technology can potentially change governance and change participation in ways that that uh, I think we haven't begun to really think about. Or you know, because the the the, uh, the other missing piece of this that we haven't talked about is that if one were to actually implement this in a city like San Francisco, even if someone came with a blank check and said, sure, let's do it, the, the most essential part of it, which is uh, we haven't spoke to, spoken about yet, is one would, both on principle and also as a, as a very necessary way to ensure the success of the, of the work, have to deeply involve and engage all the manifold populations who inhabit the neighborhoods where these places actually are. And so the the that's a puzzle you would only serve uh, solve with the kind of government 2.0 solution to be able to allow 1,500 communities to feel ownership over infrastructural investment in their uh, uh, in their surroundings at the same time in the same place and not take 
50 years doing it. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, too, because we're talking about infrastructure. Yeah. But it is interesting to imagine that maybe the solution here is not even necessarily political or, or, or that yeah. even this is not necessarily the role for government. Yeah. I mean, the, the example that comes to mind um, is actually my mother uh, lives in suburban Philadelphia, which is where I went to high school. But what, what is really interesting about the landscape out there is that it is built on these uh, t like hundreds and hundreds of creeks that have basically been uh, canalized and sent yeah. through storm drains and that kind of thing. But whenever there's a heavy rainstorm event, there's tons of flooding, at least in the neighborhoods that, that mo all of my friends from that era live in. Um, but what's interesting is that it, it's not really an infrastructural problem. Basically, it's the yeah. solved by the private sphere of people yeah. owning sump pumps in their basement and keeping a kind of civilization you know, yeah. at working yeah, yeah, yeah. in the suburbs. Yeah. But that's not necessarily a governmental approach. Right. But it's interesting to imagine this kind of thing you know, where if you and I could yeah. you know, kickstart you know, however much right. money it would take to buy one right, of these right, tiny right. slivers of land that yeah. you have identified in the book and then see what kind of thing would be possible on it. Yeah. I think that would be a, a pretty interesting experiment as well. Um, one of the people that, uh, and I just want to at least get one more question in before yeah. throwing it up to, to everybody in the audience, um, is that there's another figure in the book who I think yeah. is quite interesting, and that's Jane Jacobs. Yeah. Um, she comes up a lot, uh, especially here in New York City, where there's this Manichaean dichotomy between Jane Jacobs and Robert Moses, as if one, they're totally opposite, yeah. and two, as if you have to talk about the, uh, them at the same time. Right. Um, but you have this really interesting sort of counter history of, of Jane Jacobs, and I'm, I'm curious. You know, we've talked about yeah. how you suggest that she is simultaneously... Uh, sort of mistheorized, but also yeah. underdeveloped. And I'm wondering if you could just explain that and not talk about how it is that you see Jane Jacobs fitting into this history. Yeah, I mean, Jane Jane Jacobs is a kind of you know one of the closest things in in the in in the profession of urbanist that we have to a to a canonized you know uh, 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 saint. But like many you know saints, the 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 real story is is somewhat different and more interesting. And she would have been the the first person to reject. You know any notion of, of of kind of sanctification of herself or her ideas. I was I was deeply in, in diving a bit to, into her history. That I would, should say the book contains three kind of histories of of intellectual histories of associated ideas, which again I had to write because they did, or I enjoyed writing because they didn't exist yet in in terms of my own encounter with these figures, but um uh, and my use of their work and my work. But the first is Gordon Matta Clark. The third is a guy named um, uh, Howard Fisher, who is an architect who invented the moder modern GIS at Harvard to make drawings. And then it was appropriated by a student of his, Jack Dangermont, to become a kind of the technocratic tool it is today. So it's a kind of counter narrative of the origins of electronic mapping. But then in Jane Jacobs' case, I, I write about, about a couple of things uh, about her. First of all, she was um, about her education in evolutionary biology at Columbia in the early 1940s, which was a center of, of early thinking about the the complex metabolism of bodies and and how you learn about complex systems by studying specimens that are a part of them which i think is very relevant to the to the work and and to the idea of seeing the city through these small um uh small specimens and then i write about her her history and and deep fluency with the architectural profession which again we kind of think of her um uh lewis mumford when he wrote a very uh tr he, he trashed uh uh, her book and the pages of the New Yorker, they were very much at loggerheads. She, he, he saw himself as as having mentored her and then she you know spoke against him, uh, his kind of hatred for the city. Um, uh, he called the, the the headline for the review was Mother Jacob's Home Remedies. And from this, we kind of get a notion of her as like an activistic housewife, which couldn't be further from the truth. A, she was like an intellectual and a w worked full time since she was 17. Uh, and then uh, uh, second of all, she was deeply uh, uh, curious and deeply interested in architecture, fundamentally, not cities. She got into cities through architecture, through understanding. She was assigned to review all these housing projects for Arc Record, where she was an editor. Um, that didn't seem to be working, and she, in order to figure out why they didn't work, she had to teach herself about cities. You know, the, the, so the the notion of, of of architecture as an essential part of urban practice and as an entry to urban practice is very counter to how the kind of Jane Jacobs gospel has come down, which is pretty much a like, don't fuck it up, do no harm, like. You know, the uh, cities are complicated and messy, but we don't. Uh, uh, but architecture can only make things worse, which was not what she believed at all. Um, uh, and then uh, she was even involved in, in in commissioning and designing housing projects in the West Village before she moved to Toronto. 
um, uh, and uh, and in, through through her work, you know, I, the, the the notion of the of the city um, uh, as a as a complex ballet, as she puts it in in uh, in Death and Life, of all these different elements, all of whom have to be uh, uh, are helping each other out, providing this kind of deep resilience and adaptability that cities have, and in which we place ourselves as designers or actors. Um, uh, best when we place ourselves with the kind of consciousness of the of the complexity of the underlying urban ecology that 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 we're doing. One of the things that that has also come down into the culture of architecture schools and and the kind of you know usual exasperating conflict between planning departments and architecture departments and institutions you know like like my own is this notion that architecture can't make things better in cities. Right, that architecture only is is a kind of uh, uh, is a kind of danger, or and and that's also a um, I think very much a uh, uh, you know Jane was was never able to effectively figure out or articulate in writing what positive role urban design and architecture has to play in the in the creation of complexity where complexity doesn't exist. She wrote about its negative role in in getting rid of complexity in projects like Lincoln Center and, and the housing projects in the Upper East Side in, in kind of eviscerating this complex tissue with big, you know, dumb, dumb uh, organs that didn't work nearly as effectively. But uh, you know, the the missing piece of her intellectual output and she got interested in economies and a much larger scale of work and she never followed this through was it was a was a kind of articulate manifesto for architecture's role work. more quick question and then I'll, th I'll throw it out I, I guess you know if you use the word resilience a, yeah. a few times um, I guess I'm just curious if you could define exactly what it is that you see yeah. resilience meaning right. today and on also what is it that cities need to be resilient against you know obviously right. climate change has come yeah. up a lot in the, in, in the book but also just in recent conversation right. um, but I'm, I'm curious what are the threats facing the city uh, right. and, and how does one achieve resilience and how do you define right. that term well you know uh, we are we are subjects of a, of a of, you know before anything else, we're we're subject to the tyranny of language, right? And and resilience is a really bad word for the concept that it's used to maintain because resilience comes from the Latin for a spring, and it just means something that will go back into the same shape it had before when you poke it, right? And so this is, you know, with the tyranny of language, this is often how resilience is conceived of in an urban context. So if there's another Sandy, if you know we, we face the uncertainty of, of massively increased uh, um, uh, uh, severity and duration of climate events, we face uh, uh, difficulties in, in because of the lack of maintenance of infrastructure, we face sudden failures, catastrophic failures. Um, we face uh, uh, threats because of uh, globalization of disease and other inputs. And so for you know organizations like the Rockefeller Foundation, everybody else down, this notion of urban resilience Resilience has become a catchphrase, and and the Rockefeller Foundation has funded a hundred urban resilience officers, chief resilience office officers for a hundred cities worldwide, and it's a it's a very current discourse within the the realm of policy. It does contain with it still because of that word this notion of like how do we design things so we can go back, so we can open up again when we have to close, right? How do we go back to exactly how we were? Whereas if you look to the ideas of of uh, resilience in the natural world, in these complex systems that are our own body or large-scale ecologies, things, recovery never means uh, a, a reproduction of a pre-existing condition. Recovery is always an adaptation into new conditions, right? Re recovery is always a movement into what the biologists called uh, an the best adjacent possibility of, of where, you, where you are or what's going on. And so part of the, my thinking about my, my pushing within the larger urban conversation about resilience is to emphasize the importance of adaptation and change and the notion that the, 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 uh, the, the best infrastructure is infrastructure that can continue to adapt to circumstances that we cannot foresee. Climate change is a certainty. The effects of climate change on our cities and economies are a... A, a certain uncertainty, or in Rumsfeldian terms, you know, a, a, a known unknown, containing within it even unknown unknowns, right? So we can't, so when we're thinking about, you know, and, and, and this is what is so, uh, you know, you know, one of the many tragedies of the of the Trump era. I'm 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 unfortunately uh, uh, already of the belief that the the we will maybe spend a lot of money, probably the public money on private corporations 
building big things that can point to and, and use the word infrastructure. But these will, by definition, much as the as the brittle products of systems engineering in the space ways often able um, uh, investments. So like, like the we did the project as, as part of the 2012 Biennale and the Mose in Venice is a perfect example, is, is actually a singularly perfect example because it was um, championed and funded by Silvio Berlusconi, who's the closest analog in, in uh, recent political history we have to, um, to President Trump. It was uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of millions of euros that went to mostly his cronies in, in various large engineering firms um, uh, uh, to produce a huge piece of infrastructure that although it's technically invisible below the lagoon, was was publicized enormously as solving all of the problems of Venice, as saving Venice from um, uh, the, the, the consortium rules. They said that they needed to form, it was such a big problem, they needed all the major companies to combine into a consortium, the Consorcio Venezia Nuovo, the consortium for a new Venice to build this thing. They got all the money, they built this thing. It's already demolished, continued to demolish the ecology of the lagoon. It's unlikely ever to be effective in actually saving the city from any serious, long-lasting climatological event. And it uh, it poured literally hundreds of millions of dollars um, of the uh, of the public's money, not into a hole in the ground, but into the pockets of of those. And there's a saying in in Venice that gets to some of the themes of this uh, and and posters and protests against the mosaic, because the the Venetians understand this very viscerally. And so the, the saying is, in Mose serve solo chi ci fa. The Mose serves only those who make it. And I think this is the really the real danger with uh, with with um, uh, what is likely to be our, our new infrastructural era is that we are we are likely to make both tools. Um, uh, we're likely to bend our technology to make things that only serve those who make it, instead of of adapting and changing our technology to serve. Um, uh, those who, who might actually benefit from uh, investment in infrastructure at an urban scale. Well, and on top of that, we're going to be uh, vacating labor laws and also paying for yep. it, not through actual expenditure, but through tax breaks. Right. So it's a it's negative infrastructural investment in a funny right. way. Yeah, um, infrastructure without jobs. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and with Trump's yeah. people involved. But uh, in any case, uh, so I'd love to throw it open to questions in the audience for uh, any anything that we, has come up. Uh, you in the front, sort of here. There's a mic. Uh, you could wait a second for, uh, the, for the mic so people can hear you. Hi. Thank you guys so much. Um, I was just curious. You, you spoke about the sort of um, need to avoid, like, I mean, especially just building, um, like, rote, like, you know, poor people parks or something yeah. as interventions. Like, um, I'm curious, like, I mean, I feel like a little bit deflated by some of the interventions that have happened most recently um, in the U.S. On, in that regard. And I'm wondering, like, um, could you give an example of, like, an, um, like, something that your project may have considered in that realm as far as, like, what could be a positive uh, intervention in a community that is low income or is art is suffering some of those? I, I, I don't believe that we shouldn't build parks for poor people. This whole project is about building parks in right. underserved neighborhoods because they're the best. You know, they're, they're, it is a is an almost biblical case of of you know. We, but we shouldn't. We don't need to do it just because it makes us feel good as white liberals. We can do it because they, it is literally the best place to make that investment for the larger infrastructure and ecology of, those, of, of, of cities and not incidentally will do good work for the, for the, for the, for the people who live there. The, the problem is, I mean, the, the most progressive city um, uh, uh, in this regard has been um, Chicago under, um, uh, under Mayor Daley and then Mayor Emanuel that has had a large scale alley greening project uh, for, uh, but, but, not, but, but mostly um, around putting por porous pavement and stormwater retention into uh, um, uh, into alleys and dead ends, but with no um, uh, but but the kind of missed enormously missed design opportunity is that like oh it's porous paving it looks exactly like the regular paving that was there before so it's still even though it's dispersed it's still invisible which is how we think of of infrastructure as being and there was no notion that like oh people actually live around these places too and they they might actually want to say in how this thing is shaped and we might actually but there's a you know deservedly so given the dysfunction of our current public participation measures there's a kind of complete anxiety on the part of any planner or infrastructural engineer about any process that's participative you know and and by the same token there are you know we are building and growing better processes for participation um, uh, sometimes using technology, sometimes not. 
So I don't think that's a fair, you know, I think it's a it's a reasonable fear given the, the history and difficulty of of public participation. But, you know, without public participation, there'd be, you know, the lower Manhattan Expressway. So, you know, it's we, we, we can't oppose it on principle. Yeah, there and then then over here. Uh, hi, thanks for your thanks for your time. Um, uh, I'm I'm really new to all this, so it's been really interesting. Um, uh, so yeah, I don't I don't know a lot of the history or the terminology, so please correct me if I'm getting anything wrong. But uh, you mentioned um, that in the 60s or 70s uh, that these new parametric uh, planners yeah. used uh, GIS and computers to like optimize where to put fire stations, and then that's what caused the Bronx to burn. So um, I guess my question is like. What mistake did they make that caused them to, to do that, or what did they overlook? And and then why does this like micro targeting of vacant lots, yeah. um, like oh we're going to optimize like what lots to right. to intervene? And so why won't that make the same mistake? Uh, optimization is a really good word to unpack here because optimization is what technology was what uh, digital technology was invented to do, and it was actually invented. This is what I get to in the third history in the book. Um, uh, computers were invented to make maps. So for the for the the, the business accounting, you know, the the in in the United States we have a decennial census that um, uh, covers redistricting, which is a whole political issue, as, you know, of the of the Trump era as well. Um, the the eighteen seventy census took until eighteen seventy eight to count. The eighteen by hand using traditional accounting methods, the eighteen eighty census was going to take until eighteen ninety two to sound, to count. By those methods, so until after that, you already had to start the next census. So uh, a young engineer um, uh, named Herman Hollerith, who'd worked for the census, invented the first electronic tabulating machine and punch card, which he based on the 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 uh, railway tickets in the in the West, where unlike the East, where the conductor was likely to know all the passengers, in the West everyone was a stranger. So there were these punch tickets. You could punch out individual characteristics of the passenger, like brown hair, you know, uh, uh, blue eyes, wearing a hat, and that, to make it harder to pass your ticket on to another person. So that became the punch card that that then was used to to count the population in the 1880 census that the 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 company that Ho that Herman Hollerith founded became IBM and that's the the literal origins of, of modern computing to to count and tabulate populations the uh, in the aerospace uh, in the in the it's starting in the 1940s and 50s we have the advent of real time computing which was uh, uh, furthered you know with with magnetic core memory etc and they, they it took the same intellectual project of you know optimizing boundaries and federal expenditures to optimize things like wing shapes and and uh, uh, the you know military uh, targeting and then um, that led to the computers that we have today which you know if you have a hammer everything looks like a nail if you're a computer you want to optimize fundamentally ways is a great example of optimization in the context of the city with new amounts of information it's an example of something that computers do well but you can't actually optimize almost anything about the city except maybe things that were invented in by engineers like traffic flows in fact the city is fundamentally unconducive to optimization. So are you and I. You and I are complex ecologies of microfauna and DNA with all kinds of massive redundancies. We are not, it is a total myth about evolution that it optimizes. This was the myth that was demolished by Stephen Jay Gould in the, in the, 1870, in the 1970s in the context of evolutionary biology. Evolution does not optimize. It in fact tends to favor those characteristics, modularity, adaptability, redundancy, that means that we don't die every time we get a cold. So in the context of the city, this was, an, and uh, um, uh, Jane Jacobs was in fact educated in, in very state-of-the-art evolutionary biology at Columbia for two years, and that's what she literally borrowed when she started to talk about the city as an organism in which there's no optima, and in which people who are looking for optima, like you know her, her nemesis Robert Moses, who are looking at improving flows, at optimizing journeys, etc., will never get you know, what it is to wander, what it is to, to know your neighbors, what it is to be integrated in this complex network. My project does not, it, it optimizes one very little thing, which is to say, given many thousands of sites that are relatively well paced for, placed for what are called ecosystem services or ecological, ecological infrastructure, it runs simulation of water flow, um, uh, sunlight and um, uh, uh, a couple of other wind, a couple of other environmental variables that are pretty easy to simulate and figures out how you can do the most ecological benefit using the least material on that one little site and where, where it might go. That's all 
there is in the book. And in fact, the drawings in the book, they, they pull back from even showing, um, uh, you know, these, these individual, uh, this is how the book, so there's many thousands of book, this is a Lisbon Triennale, these many thousands of drawings, but the, the drawings in the book, they, they don't, they very precisely don't try and show very detailed design work because the, the work, the very detailed design work would be left to be done with the communities actually involved. It simply tries to show in each case of each site where you could best use physical resources to do the most ecological work. Everything else is not optimized, you know, inherently. And it's also not optimized because of course, to, to retain stormwater, you could just add capacity to the main city sewer and the main sewer, you know, the main sewer retention plant. The problem is if you, you can never add enough capacity to be sure at some point it won't catastrophically fail because there's even more capacity than you built it for. So, so my, uh, the, my proposal deploys all these sort of biologically inspired techniques of n multiple networks of redundancy. And so it says if you have 1,500 small stormwater retention uh, facilities, then a whole bunch of them can just not work, which is what technology will always do, and still mostly it'll work which is like a very, you know, it's bio-inspired, <laughs> you know, but not bio-inspired in the sense that architects have come to understand it as some kind of optimal dragonfly wing arrangement, which is a total misunderstanding of, of biology, but rather, you know, t to take the lesson of biology of like, you know, the best way to make it work is to have a thousand tiny things that all have the same job, like your immune system, instead of one big thing that can fail, you know, catastrophically. Cool, yeah, great. Okay. Uh, very briefly, that, uh, Nicholas mentioned this, but there's a there's a book if you're if you're curious about the Bronx fires, there's a book called The Fires by a guy named Joe Flood, and that's a that's a really good introduction to what the Rand Institute did in terms of shutting down fire stations yeah. and and leading to infernos and writing off entire neighborhoods as as an experiment in fire control that went disastrously wrong. Right. And and what that really was 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 computers and optimization as an excuse for the 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 exercise of of power along racial and political. Divides, you know that that's which is probably what we will face from even the the I, I think the the worst of the of the of, of, of even Trump's nominees are you know are, are visibly incompetent and corrupt, but the even the best of them um, you know will likely be making these kinds of seemingly um, um, seemingly un incontrovertible arguments about optimization and the best expenditure of resources to move around money in cities and in the country in ways which fundamentally benefit, you know, yeah. their friends. Yeah. Well, thank you for the talk. It was very nice. Um, I guess I, from what seemed from the presentation, it seemed like you used a parametric script to allocate funds from a large, for your work in San Francisco, to specific vacant yep. lots in specific areas. Um, with, I guess, the implementations being a known unknown of the infrastructure, what uh, factors limit? How did you limit the factors and quantify the factors to make the allocation right. of the funds? Well, th th that was a very specific like policy modeling effort, which which was not to say that the you know San Francisco at the time I was doing this work was spending one and a half billion dollars to upgrade its storm water system to better meet peak flow. And, and, and even though we've had a drought, starting the, this year, the drought, the drought broke a little bit. And we had, again, more of these e even more catastrophic rain events than we ever have. All the rain comes in a couple of months, and it comes in huge storms. And so all the pipes are sized for those huge storms. But even then, the storms are getting bigger and more severe. So you start to get the problems in the combined sewer system, like here in New York. And so every sewer in San Francisco was being dug up and expanded to better meet peak flow, which is insane, right? Uh, uh, the, it's a very traditional way to spend infrastructural money. And so the, that exercise was a, was a way of saying, OK, what if you took half of that money, just for the sake of argument, and apportioned it to all of these sites in proportion to the amount of ecological benefit they could do? How much money would you end up with per site, just as, a, as an argument? It turns out to be $600 a square foot for all of those sites, which I mean, you can you can spend a lot of money making a making a park, but it's very hard to get up to six hundred. I mean, that's like you know, yeah. high end housing. So the the point the, the point of the argument is that like you know the the this that was uh, uh, an argument for policymakers to change their thinking about 
what something like this would cost in the context of how money is spent. In in the in the proposals in LA and New York, we did more detailed, you know, granular arguments about what are, what are the actual costs of you know park making and this kind of infrastructure in these places and and but nowhere. But it turns out spending money in that kind of centralized way and that kind of infrastructure is very inefficient because you're not using the infrastructure almost all of the time. You know, you're you're using it for a few. There was a question towards the back. Yeah. Is that correct, or did that disappear? Uh, hi, um, I'm not an architect. I'm a I'm a data guy actually. And what you were saying about the aerospace industry and optimization got me thinking. Uh, I don't disagree with you that uh, human bodies and cities and these things. They optimization is not an appropriate thing to do to them, but. I feel very much that the people who are in ascendancy do believe these things. Um, Dominic Cummings, who was head of data science for Vote Brexits, kept going around saying, hire physicists. And the hedge funds and financial industry, the quants were all PhDs in mathematics and mm. physics. Um, Peter Thiel. Uh, and I imagine that there are lots of real estate developers using much more complex models with much bigger yeah clusters doing things similar yeah. to you, except their only goal is profit. Um, to what extent are we like woefully behind? I, I, I can't help but think that we're kind of scrambling to catch up with these people, and they're in ascendancy and political power, and they truly do believe ideologically right. in those things. And to, in your conversations and in, with local governments, do you do you feel that pushback? I, I feel local governance are 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 often as suspicious of you know with with some exceptions are are you know will always be suspicious about someone coming in and telling them that they've solved the city, right? That that's just anyone who does urban work just knows that that's never going to be the case. The city is defined by its its lack of tractability to any one solution um a bit like medicine like so while well, sometimes you're really sick and one thing makes you better like a certain like uh this is also I'm, I'm 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 i was just on a plane flight so i was reading the new yorker but there's a wonderful long article by atul gawanda about the importance of of long-term primary care over like surgery that's you know that, that that does far more good for far more people than like the singular intervention surgical intervention and it's a great again it's not even a metaphor for the city because the city is a natural system that works in the same way and so any solution to urban problems is much more likely to be seeing your doctor over the course of six years and slowly altering patterns of, of life other than opening you up and switching your heart out with a better model so but um, uh, this tendency for, for immediate results and a faith in the power of data does lead to strange situations like uh, several years ago under the Bloomberg administration, which very much believed in data uh, and data's ability to, to solve problems. You had a uh, huge investment in by, by the Bloomberg administration and by NYU in something called the Center for Urban Science and Progress, which still exists. Not a single person with any urban training or degree was involved in that program. But, by choice, it was the 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 phys physicists, uh, um, uh, economists, you know, uh, uh, data modelers. You know, the whole notion was let's get the the city people out because they're always to the ones telling us things can't be done, and use the people who can use large quantities of data and optimize solutions. People from the Department of Energy, the the head lead scientist was the former lead scientist of the Department of Energy, working on things like nuclear bombs, and and this was the the you know, and, and so you have a strange. Uh, 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 belief or faith sometimes in some urban context in the power of, of data and computation to, to solve it all. Um, uh, but as I say, anyone who's spent any amount of time doing work in cities knows that things are much, 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 much more complicated. Um, even an incredibly well meeting and very thoughtful um, ur urban organization like Code for America in San Francisco is increasingly moving towards work in social services versus data-based work with urban governance because social services is a data problem, like connecting people to, to, to benefits that they're eligible for based on certain policy metrics. You know, and that's, you can really help people doing that work. But, but cities, it's very difficult to find a problem in a city that can be solved through data alone. Um, data is a very, very important. You know, we we do, we also really sell ourselves short if we don't use the power, the incredible power of computation to visualize and understand complex situations with greater complexity. 
mean, the only reason we build sewer pipes as big centralized tubes is because that's all we could model when we started building them, was do, doing math on paper of cross sections and flows and a bit of physics about how, how tight the, cor you, the corners you make. Now we can do much more complicated urban scale models of water flow and we probably don't need that kind of infrastructure anymore. So what we can compute you know, does often result in what we can actually make and, and what we can compute has radically changed but what we make in cities hasn't. Are there other questions? Uh, so as far as I'm aware, there are books yeah. for sale at the back, and uh, I would definitely recommend. Uh, there's so many other topics yeah. that we haven't even gotten yeah. onto, um, including the, the the history of GIS and its, right. its bizarre relationship with military modeling and, and whatnot. Yeah. But um, I think Nicholas is going to hang out for a couple of minutes, so please yeah. come up and grab Nicholas or grab him back there if you want to get him to sign the book. Yeah, I'm going to quickly show people the book. I, I don't make a lot of money off the books, but I, I would I would love it if um, we were able to sell some tonight. And I think the books are, are important as little uh, little pieces of this message in the world. The book contains 3,659 drawings that the amazing Dutch information design studio catalog tree helped me size and place um, uh, throughout the, the book. Um, uh, uh, the book is these, uh, this was the work in Venice, and the book is... Uh, individual uh, drawings and case studies um, uh, and maps of, uh, of areas in New York and other cities are interspersed with all these drawings. The drawings are sized according to the ecological benefit of each intervention and they're placed left to right according to their, um, uh, according to the longitude in the city, so where they are from east to west. And that's how the book, so the book is a, is a, is a kind of an interface to this uh, information as well. And then it contains these uh, uh, kind of um, uh, 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 histories of sort of adaptation and intellectual work, um, both in, in the work of Gordon Mataclark and Jane Jacobs. Uh, they lived, uh, not incidentally, several blocks from each other. And then this was uh, Howard Fisher, who, who saw maps like this being used in the context of urban redevelopment in HUD in the 1960s and then hacked this IBM teleprinter to instead produce maps like this that could effectively produce the shades of gray and subtleties of urban situations. And uh, uh, this software, open source produced by Harvard, was taken to uh, Redlands, California by a guy named Jack Dangermond, who's now worth $2.7 billion in funds, um, whose company is behind um, uh, the major um, uh, arc map, the major GIS system used by the US government, the NSA, and um, many other people in the world. So um, uh, those are all the things in the book. I, uh, if you would like me to deface your book, I'm happy to sign it. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll hang out here as long as uh, folks have questions or are interested. So uh, thank you again all for coming out. I can't believe we filled the space, and I'm so grateful and delighted um, uh, that all of you came. So thanks again. Give yourself a round of applause. And thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Eva.